item four, standing in the name of Ms Fairman, uh, relating to a motion for leave to introduce the road transport amendment medicinal cabin, uh, cannabis exemptions from offences bill. Mr Assistant President. You're on. Thank you, Mr Assistant President. I move. Deputy. Pigreef. Of course, sorry. Hire sorry, Pig Rod. <laughs> Mr. Deputy President, I move. I do move that leave be given, that leave be given to bring in a bill for an act to amend the Road Transport Act 2013 to exclude users of medicinal cannabis from the application of the offence relating to driving with the presence of certain drugs in a person's oral fluid, blood or urine and for related purposes. No, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Mr Deputy President, I present the bill and move that the bill be read a first time and printed. The question is that the bill be read a first time and printed. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Those the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Mr Deputy... No, 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 just one moment. Sorry. Uh, road Transport Amendment, Medicinal Cannabis Exemptions from Offences Bill 2021, first read. Ms Fairman. Mr Deputy President, I move that this bill now be read a second time. It is with great pleasure that I introduce the Road Transport Amendment Medicinal Cannabis Exemptions from Offences Bill 2021 on behalf of the Greens as a Greens Drug Law Reform and Harm Reduction spokesperson. This bill seeks to end the injustice that has been perpetrated by this government against patients who legally and legitimately access medicinal cannabis. The bill is simple. It amends the Road Transport Act 2013 to provide an exemption to people who test positive for THC in their system while driving if the THC was obtained and administered in accordance with the Poisons and Therapeutic Goods Act 1966 or a corresponding act of another state or territory. Importantly, the defence only applies if THC is the only illicit drug present in a person's system at the time they test positive. The person must have consumed a legally prescribed medicinal cannabis product and importantly, they had to have consumed the product according to the guidance of their doctor. This guidance will include how to use the product in such a way as to avoid driving while impaired as is the case for some other prescription drugs like opioids. This will not provide a catch-all defence for persons with a medicinal cannabis, cannabis prescription that are demonstrably impaired. Part 1115 of the Road Transport Act provides a medical defence for those found driving with morphine present in their system if it was consumed for medical purposes. Medical purposes means a, a drug prescribed by a medical practitioner taken in accordance with a medical practitioner's prescription or B, a codeine-based medicinal drug purchased from a pharmacy that has been taken in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. Morphine is exceedingly more dangerous than medicinal cannabis, both on and off the road, and has been found to delay reflex responses for up to 36 hours. If this government can provide a medical defence to those who legitimately use morphine for their pain, it has no justification for not providing the same defence to the growing thousands of Australians who legally use medicinal cannabis. In 2016, the federal government legalised access to medicinal cannabis. After a campaign led by Lucy Haslam, a retired nurse whose 20-year-old son, Dan, was diagnosed with bowel cancer in 2010, gained national attention. Medicinal cannabis provided relief to Dan, whose chemotherapy killed his appetite gave him nausea, mouth ulcers, and made him vomit. And I know, uh, Mr Deputy President, that you are well aware um, of this family and what they went through because they were from Tamworth. Yep. Um, Dan's father, Lou, who had worked undercover for the New South Wales Drug Squad from 1972 to 2006, told of how things got so bad for Dan that he would vomit just at the thought of chemotherapy. 
So Mr Haslam tells of the life-changing moment when a family friend who had colon cancer offered some cannabis for Dan to try after everything else failed. His son's ulcers disappeared, his appetite returned and his nausea decreased. In the words of Lou Haslam, he tried every bloody pharmaceutical drug. They did nothing. This was really working. Stories similar to Dan Haslam's were repeated over and over again and finally medicinal cannabis was made legally available through the TGA's special access scheme. In the five years since, the number of Australians accessing medicinal cannabis has exploded. Up to 12th of October this year, the TGA had approved over 180,000 applications <coughs> for medicinal cannabis products. Fresh Leaf Analytics, the leading supplier of data on the medicinal cannabis industry in Australia, found that the number of active medical, as reported, that the number of active medical patients has grown from 30,000 at the end of 2020 to 70,000 in September. This number is predicted to reach 75,000 by the year's end with the exponential growth of the industry expected to continue into 2022 and beyond. Yet, when our national laws were changed to make cannabis available for medicinal use, our driving laws didn't. The United Kingdom, New Zealand, Norway, Germany and Ireland all provide a medical defence for testing positive to THC to protect medicinal cannabis patients if they were not impaired and were using the drug as directed. But despite the explosion in prescribing medicinal cannabis use in Australia, Tasmania is the only state with a medical defence to drug driving charges for medicinal cannabis patients. The roadside drug testing regime in New South Wales has also increased dramatically. From 38,830 tests conducted in 2014 to a whopping 166,351 tests in 2019. Unlike other road safety measures though, there has been no discernible decrease in road trauma as a result of the roadside drug testing regime. Random breath testing, on the other hand, which was introduced in 1982, has. Of course, we know that. A 1985 study on the impacts of RBT found a 25.7 reduction in fatalities and an 11.4% reduction in injuries in 1983 compared to the pre-RBT average. Since then, trauma from fatal crashes involving alcohol in New South Wales has dropped from about 40% of all fatalities to the two, two in 2017, just 15%. Similarly, legislation making seatbelts compulsory in New South Wales, which was introduced at the end of 1971, and a 1973 analysis comparing actual road fatalities in 1972 to expected fatalities found a 25% reduction in deaths. Meanwhile, deaths associated with drug driving have not decreased but have remained steady since 2014, despite the exponential increase in roadside drug testing, which I mentioned earlier. Despite this, the government has set in 2020 a target of 200,000 tests. Given that the test costs at least $40 per unit, this represents an $8 million cost to the taxpayer. This is without accounting for the costs of police personnel, increased pressure on the criminal justice system, and the social costs of individuals negatively impacted by entering the criminal justice system. The roadside tests used by New, New South Wales Police are incredibly sensitive to THC. Just five nanograms per millimetre is enough to trigger, just five nanograms per millilitre is enough to trigger a positive result. But this result will be used as evidence that a person was driving while impaired by THC. The New South Wales government has previously claimed that THC remains in your system for up to 12 hours. In reality, regular cannabis users can take up to 22 to 24 hours <coughs> to drop below 10 nanograms, and even light or moderate use can trigger a test over 24 hours, a positive test over 24 hours later. Many medicinal cannabis patients have reported testing positive days or even weeks after they had last consumed cannabis. Even some CBD products that are consumed regularly and contain very low levels of THC um, can accumulate in fat cells and trigger a positive test. Unlike alcohol, where a 0.05 blood alcohol concentration is widely accepted as too drunk to drive, <coughs> 
there is no consensus on how many nanograms per milliliter of THC represents impairment. There is definitely, though, not a shred of evidence behind the sensitivity to THC in the tests used by New South Wales Police. There is, however, a wealth of evidence that impairment caused by cannabis is relatively short-lasting. The University of Sydney Lambert Initiative conducted a comprehensive analysis of 80 scientific studies to determine the window of impairment caused by the consumption of THC. The analysis indicated that impairment may last up to 10 hours if high doses of THC are consumed orally, when lower doses of THC are consumed via smoking or vaporising, the duration is generally four hours. One study found, found, also found almost no increase in crash or culpability risk from the presence of THC. A different study found that users within THC with THC in their system were only 1.1 to 1.4 times more likely to be involved in a crash than sober drivers. This is comparable to antidepressants, Mr Deputy President, which are completely legal to use while driving but increase the likelihood of a crash by 1.35 to 1.4 times. A study measuring the driving performance of occasional cannabis users who vaporised 13.7 milligrams of THC found modest driving impairment at 40 to 100 minutes and no impairment at 240 to 300 minutes. The Lambert Institute's, the Lambert Institute's Dr McCartney has stated, it's becoming increasingly clear that our drug driving laws are not only out of date but hugely unreasonable now that we have tens of thousands of Australians using legal prescribed medical cannabis. Our drug driving laws, Mr Deputy President, should be about enhancing road safety and minimising inju injury, not about criminalising drivers who have only the mere <coughs> presence of a drug in their system but aren't impaired. The current situation in New South Wales is that if a person tests positive to THC while driving, they are found guilty of an offence under section 111 of the Road Transport Act 2013. In May 2019, police were given the power to issue a penalty notice for a first-time drug driving offence resulting in an instant three-month licence disqualification and on-the-spot fine of $572. If an offender decides to challenge the offence, in court, it can result in a fine of $2,200 and a six-month licence disqualification period, though a judge has leniency to drop that suspension back to six month, uh, three months, but that is all. 9,446 <coughs> people tested positive for THC in 2019 from roadside drug tests in New South Wales. That is one year, 9,446 people. This means potentially thousands of individuals, well it does, not even potentially, thousands of individuals have been penalised for the mere presence of a drug in their system, despite any lack of evidence that they were ever impaired. This is already an incredible injustice, but this government goes further, really, waging a war on patients for whom medicinal cannabis is the only serious relief from chemotherapy, chronic pain, multiple sclerosis and a litany of other serious uh, illnesses and pain. This is despite the fact that these patients are accessing, once again, legally prescribed me medical cannabis under the instruction of a doctor. This is just, and this is despite there being no evidence that they are a danger on our roads, and despite there being no evidence that a positive test for THC indicates impairment. Loss of licence often leads to a loss of income, financial distress, housing instability, and sometimes even the breakdown of relationships. This government has no plans to address this gaping hole in our justice system, leaving thousands of users to make the impossible choice of living with the risk of a serious drug driving charge or foregoing the, their driver's licence, not being able to drive when they need to, or foregoing their use of a life-changing medicine. My office has been contacted by many people whose lives have been changed for the better after being diagnosed with an illness and prescribed medicinal cannabis. Jay, 
contacted me in May this year telling me how he has been recently diagnosed with a crippling condition called functional neurological disorder as well as complex PTSD. He said he found legally prescribed medicinal cannabis with THC to be life-changing despite the almost prohibitive cost. It enables him to perform otherwise challenging tasks but also normal tasks like walking and going about his day. As a result of his condition, he moved to what he thought would be a more peaceful location uh, in the hills of Nimbin to rehabilitate some rainforest while living off his savings and where community attitudes were more positive towards his medicine. He told me how this has left him caught up in a discriminatory campaign that has ruined his reputation and future prospects despite always, as he said, living a life guided by what he thought were high moral standards. He told me how he had to face court for driving with THC present in his saliva, which is from his medication that he took at 4am uh, the night before he was caught so that he could drive to the airport the following afternoon to pick up his elderly father. There are many other stories like those of Jay's. The injustice of this system was one of the motivations for former magistrate David Halpern to retire early after serving from um, 1999 to 2020. While magistrate Halpern presided over Lismore local, local court, he was overwhelmed with drug driving cases with Richmond Tweed area leading the state in drug driving charges between 2015 and 2016. During this time, he made a number of groundbreaking rulings in favour of those he judged to have been unfairly targeted by the roadside drug testing regime, including hundreds of people who were charged despite having a prescription for medicinal cannabis. He even found a driver not guilty of driving under the influence influence of cannabis after he was satisfied he had not consumed the drug for nine days prior to testing positive. After stepping down from his position, David Halpern told the ABC, we had a situation where people were taking their medicine as prescribed. They weren't driving in any adverse way and yet they were losing their licence, being fined and getting a criminal record. I started driving home from work thinking, I just can't do this. Now, David Halpern is the director of Drive Changes campaign to achieve exactly what is in this bill, a medical defence to drug driving charges for users of medicinal <coughs> cannabis. Speaking to Sydney criminal lawyers, David Halpern explained how a defence for medicinal cannabis patients would function, and I quote him. If people are apprehended and if people have a detectable level of THC in their system, then they should be able to show their medical certificate and have a defence. That defence is that they have a prescription and are using it in accordance with that prescription. Therefore, they weren't driving under the influence in the sense of being adversely affected. That should be the defence. That way, the police can exercise their discretion because they wouldn't have reasonable prospects of success in the court. If someone shows them the prescription on the side of the road, they can refer it up for there to be a decision not to prosecute on the normal prosecutorial principles as there is a valid and available defence. So ideally, these people would never go to court, Mr Deputy President, and if they did, they would have a defence to that charge. They, that would update us with much of the rest of the world, and it would be a start with reform in this very important area." End quotes of uh, David Halpern. Former Magistrate Halpern also stated that in terms of increasing road safety, what would happen then is that people would stop, many people would stop using opioids, barbiturates and other drugs that really do have an adverse effect on driving, even though detectable levels aren't a defence. Instead, we have a drug driving framework that actively discourages the uptake of medicinal cannabis and drives people to, let's be honest, more dangerous drugs like opioids, even though the risk of those drugs causing road trauma is significantly greater. This bill builds on the work of uh, my uh, Greens uh, colleagues in, in other states, including Greens MLC Tammy, Tammy Franks in South Australia, who introduced her Road Traffic Medicinal Cannabis Amendment Bill 2021, as well as the Victorian Road Safety Amendment Medicinal Cannabis Bill 2019, which was introduced in that state by uh, Fiona Patton of the Reason Party. I also acknowledge the work of my colleague David Shoebridge in this place, who has campaigned on this issue for many 
years, including moving, moving an amendment to the Road Transport Legislation Bill 2020 in October last year, which aimed to introduce a similar defence. Of course, it didn't get uh, through. I also recognise the work of those in the legal field and the community who have been campaigning for this compassionate, fair and eminently sensible reform for many years. I also want to recognise the exceptional work of the fairly new organisation Drive Change in raising the awareness of the need for drug driving law reform that's fair, equal and improves public health. Mr Deputy President, this reform is long overdue and increasingly urgent. This reform should have happened when medicinal cannabis was legalised at the federal level in 2016. Instead, medicinal cannabis patients have been discriminated against and forced not to drive because our laws haven't kept up. We need to change that. I commend this bill to the House. Government Whip. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I move that this uh, item be uh, um, adjourned for five the question is that this bill be adjourned for five calendar days. All those in favour, please say aye. Those the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clerk will read the order of the day.